Welcome back everybody. This is part three of the Fisher Studio Standard uh, Repair Series that I'm uploading to YouTube. This was all shot uh, in 2014. Uh, you'll notice in the background that I was doing this uh, at the same time that I was doing the Kenwood Care 9840, the recap job on that. Uh, for those of you who have been with me since the beginning of this channel, you'll remember that video that I did of recapping that uh, beautiful Kenwood uh, 9940 quadraphonic receiver. Uh, so this video is going to be about rebuilding the amplifier section and I'll let you see how that turned out. Well I w went ahead and decided to go ahead and pull the amplifier out of this unit and uh, it's interesting the way they did this because this whole unit comes out uh, from the back of the chassis right here. It's screwed in around there. Um, I've had to pull the bottom cover down and unscrew this uh, power supply board right here uh, so I get enough play in this to be able to pull uh, this out of here, twist it out and then get it out of here. Um, this transistor when it blew it also was kind enough to go ahead and blow these transistors as well. <clears throat> so I'm gonna have to order some transistors for this guy and I'm gonna go ahead and replace all of these transistors including uh, the same three on this side that got blown over here. And the reason that I'm going to do that is because um, the uh, modern equivalent to this transistor uh, is rated for 200 watts of power. Now I don't expect this receiver to deliver that kind of power obviously but in order to keep the uh, power equal to both channels, I'm going to have to replace both of these uh, transistors. And I'm going to replace all of these transistors, the other three, uh, on this uh, side as well, to try to keep everything equal as far as the transistors goes on for the, for the output stage of the amplifier. Um, everything else checks out fine on this. Uh, I'm also going to go ahead and replace these capacitors, even though I don't really believe that they're bad. Um, since I've got to go ahead and resolder this anyway, I'm going to go ahead and replace these with some Panasonic uh, FC series. And I'm also going to go ahead and, and do a partial recap of the power supply. I'm going to replace these uh, big capacitors along here. Um, the main filter caps I'm going to leave because these things are eight bucks a piece and I don't really feel like paying that. So I don't really think they're bad, but I figure a partial recap job might be pretty good. I'm going to use uh, Panasonic FM series uh, for these down here. Uh, I'm also going to go ahead and replace all the fuses, the two back here and all these down here just to freshen those up a bit. Just uh, even though they're not blown, it's just you know nice to have some fresh fuses, and then I'll save these fuses for test fuses in the future. Um, it's interesting about Fisher. Um, Fisher uh, was bought out by Sanyo, and Sanyo is owned by Panasonic, so I figured it was uh, fitting to use Panasonic uh, capacitors in this unit. Uh, also, it's interesting that uh, when I looked up these uh, transistor part numbers. Um, they actually came up as a Sanyo part number, so that's interesting. Um, you know, if this was not a Fisher, or if this thing, this amplifier was rated at only 20 or 30 watts a channel, I wouldn't bother with this, but, you know, Fisher equipment is valuable, and it's rare, and because Fisher is essentially not even around anymore because Sanyo bought them, and Panasonic is apparently phasing out the brand and I read that on Wikipedia so you know who knows how accurate that is but I bet you it's probably true um, you know you're not gonna see Fisher equipment anymore so I think that this is definitely worth putting some time and, and a little bit of money into uh, I'm not gonna put a whole lot of money into this because I really don't know uh, what I'm gonna have when this is all said and done uh, if I have something extremely kick-ass, though, I may go ahead and, and do a full recap on this bad boy. Um, this thing has mostly uh, shoey capacitors, if I'm pronouncing that right. I have never heard of that brand, so there are some Rubicons, 
Um, the only Nichicons I've found are these right here. Everything else is either Rubicon or these Shoei brand of capacitors, but um, I think there might be a, there's a couple Rubicons down here. I'm not sure, I don't remember which one of these are, um, but um, there's really not a whole lot of capacitors to replace in this thing, so other than the main filter caps, it really wouldn't be um, a whole big expensive job to do so. And being that this receiver, or this uh, amplifier, I should say, is more than 15 years old, it's probably a good idea to start thinking about replacing these caps. If I um, plan on using this for any extended period of time, but uh, we'll see what we got. So I'm going to place that order. And uh, I think I'm going to tear apart the tape deck. And uh, maybe that'll be a separate video because that thing's all gummed up and there's all kinds of dirt in it and stuff like that and it ain't working. So, But this would be probably a pretty interesting system to have all together once it's said and done. So it's going to be a couple days before I get parts in. So we'll hit you back when I get them in. I also need to replace the two uh, light bulbs back here that are burned out and I'm going to put some uh, uh, LEDs in here. I'm going to try some different LEDs in here. I also need to check and see what the voltage is coming off of these leads uh, and see what uh, if I need to put a resistor in there or if the LEDs that I have is going to work fine for this without any kind of modification. Uh, I don't know if I don't see any other uh, lights right now on this amplifier but uh, there might be some over here. I'm not entirely certain, but we'll see. I know this one's definitely out, though. Well, I got all the parts in from Mauser to fix this Fisher amplifier right here. And I started by removing the transistors on here. I stopped when I got to this one and decided I need to start filming this, so here you go. Um, I went ahead and marked on here the transistors that were in these two places so I know automatically that the opposite one was the one that I didn't mark. I also went ahead on the list here of parts I ordered and, and wrote down the original part number that was in the amplifier for the corresponding new replacement part that I ordered so I knew which one went to where and that was this sheet that I made right here of all the values and capacitors and transistors and the part numbers and the brands that I ordered and stuff like that. I also did a quick diagram draw out here, the layout of the transistors. Some of these I just wrote down, but I'm not replacing them, um, so I know where they're at. <clears throat> and I also made sure to keep track of, there's this symbol right here on the circuit board, on the amplifier, where the transistors go. So I made sure to keep uh, a good visual record there of which way those transistors were facing uh, versus the way it shows on the diagram on the uh, circuit board itself. So I know right away which way to put them in so I don't put them in backwards. So I'm going to go ahead and finish. I've already got this all desoldered. I'm going to go ahead and finish taking this out. Um, it's interesting that this receiver built in 1986 all the thermal compound is still uh, gooey. Hell of a good thermal compound, I guess they used. Although they didn't, uh, <laughs> they didn't care about how much they put on apparently, because it is a sloppy mess in here. But uh, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, put a little bit of new stuff on the surfaces of these uh, insulators here, and uh, I'll be good to go on that. One freshly recapped amplifier board. Transistors are replaced. And I just got to put it back in the heat sink here. Apply a little thermal compound to those two. <clears throat> and we'll go ahead and get those other transistors mounted on there. Getting closer. Well, we have reached the part of this repair video that I need to stop and explain a few things. Um, I could edit this stuff out of the video or decide not to record it at all. However, um, part of training videos or repair videos or whatever you want to call these is sometimes more beneficial to learn from other people's mistakes. Hopefully you won't make the same mistake that I did. So I went in and I put all the new transistors in all around there. also went and recapped it. I pushed the power button. It came on. I checked my voltages 
and I was right on the money. So I decided to hook up the speakers and the CD player. And lo and behold, it was playing music. And boy, did it sound very, very good. It was really thumping those RTRs right there. So I decided to test the bass and treble adjustments and the loudness. And when I pumped up the bass just a little bit, and that's when, of course, the Magic Smoke and the Genie, who lives in the lamp, got blown out of his lamp, so to speak. He had feet and arms just kind of coming out, just kind of dangling out of the, of the lamp there. So what happened was is that ended up blowing uh, one transistor, all the fused uh, resistors around here, and it took me more hours than I care to admit to try and trace down everything that had gotten fried. What happened was I didn't replace these diodes right here, and there's three of them in this unit. There's one there, and there's two back here. There's one down here, and then there's one soldered to the back of this board right here. All three of those, or at least after the amplifier blew, were all shorted. So I figured that at least one or two of them, or probably all of them, were in fact shorted out. And because I had not checked that before I started testing it, I only got about two minutes before the magic smoke finally blew out of it and it died again. What threw me for a loop was that after that point I had 63 volts pouring out of all of this on this side of the amplifier which is the uh, left channel I believe. Left or right, I don't remember. Anyway, it doesn't matter what side this is. And it also fried, well it didn't fry but it started to try anyway there's a resistor right down here that goes to the uh, headphone jack. So, needless to say, it took a long time to trace out after replacing these diodes and one transistor and I fa did find one bad solder joint that I had to refix. The uh, traces on this board are not great and they seem to be uh, coming off with a little bit of heat to them, so I had to be very careful. This one I didn't even know about. But anyway, suffice it to say that uh, tracking down why it was dumping out 63 volts ended up being a real trouble, because normally when that happens, it's usually a shorted out uh, transistor somewhere in the circuit. And that wasn't the case here. Ended up being, going all the way back to, let's see which one here, this one right here, this transistor. There is a fusible resistor right here that I didn't think about even bothering to check because I was thinking of this side fo forward. I wasn't even thinking about this side. And these two transistors here end up supplying the bias voltage to this uh, amplifier. And because this transistor wasn't getting its the I don't remember if it was the base or collector or which voltage it was. Because it wasn't getting that, it was all the rest of these were just dumping out 63 volts by default. So once I found that, I don't have any fusible resistors, so I had to find the closest resistor out of another receiver. So I so I uh, uh, a receiver donated its magic smoke to fix this amplifier. So I've got a 22 ohm, there's a 22 ohm fusible resistor down here. Um, there's another one somewhere in this circuit, I can't see where it's at right now. And then there's this guy over here, and he's an 82 ohm. So I found some resistors that match the ohm anyway. Even though they're not technically fusible, they should still, they still work just fine. So the problem that I have now is that the voltages are fine and I haven't let any magic smoke out yet, but the problem with the unit now is that, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and plug it in here. Let me see if I've got anything here that's going to give me a bad day or not before I do. And I should be okay there. 
so the problem here, and I'll show you this, I'm going to go ahead and plug this guy in. Let me see if I can find the right power cord here, which is starting to become a real hassle. Okay, so that's what happens when I turn it on. Now if I turn the volume all the way down, the display goes wacko on it. And you can see the loudness button also lights up. So something got zapped over here as well in the control. And there is some voltages coming out of the amplifier, these three right here. Uh, one of these, anyway, goes back into here. Actually, all six of them go back into there. So it could be either any one of these. I'm, I'm hoping it's a bad uh, diode or something like that that got hit when 63 volts started dumping into all this stuff. But uh, that's why I haven't plugged any speakers up to it yet, because I honestly don't know if this is controlling the volume or not. And I don't want to plug speakers in when I've got 100% volume dumping into this thing. So, shut that off. But I didn't let any magic smoke out. Anyway, here's the lesson to be learned from my mistake, folks. When you work on these things, always, 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 always check for shorted diodes. Because if you don't, and there is a shorted diode, it's going to give you a very bad day like this did. As a matter of fact, like I said, it was more than a day, more than two days worth of tracing this and pulling this amplifier in and out of here before I finally figured out where the problem was on this thing. Something simple took a long time to trace back because there was a lot of components here that could have been causing a short. And that brings me to the other thing that I found interesting because I had to obviously print out service manual for this. And the main power transistors on the back of this thing, or final output transistors, however you want to term this, were all uh, Sanyo parts. These guys right here, and I replaced all of them. Now, when I looked at the cross-reference, the cross-reference uh, listed, um, I don't remember what the part number was, but they were, the old ones were a 120 watt uh, transistor, which would match the 120 watt maximum rating on the display right here. Now according to the service manual, although I have the only service manual I have is for the 870, not the 871, and the 870 looks like the European version of this unit and it has a little bit of extra goodies on that amplifier board right there. Um, it says that this amplifier is rated for 100 watts per channel. Minimum 100 watts per channel is what it says. So, I said in, a, in earlier in this video that I found it interesting that they only used 120 watt um, transistors in this for what I was assuming was probably a 100 watt amplifier, 100 watt per channel. Well, the interesting thing is is that the service manual, you go over here to the main amplifier, Q1 through Q4 right there are those main amplifier transistors. And those are the exact part numbers that I put into this that came up on the cross-reference. Not what was in here. So these are a Sanyo part. And since Fisher, I'm not sure if Fisher was owned by Sanyo at this time. I think this was built in 87 sometime. I don't know if they were owned yet by Fisher or by Sanyo or not. But I know Sanyo was building these things for uh, Fisher back then. So all these parts in here have are either Sanyo or they have a Sanyo uh, part number to them. Um, but uh, I find it interesting that the service manual references the exact um, transistor number that I put into this that came up just as a cross reference. And I find that interesting because I'm kind of wondering if, except for the fact that I blew it up the second time with not having those transistors in there, or the uh, diodes in there correctly, because I didn't replace them, so it was creating shorts in here. Um, I find it curious because I wonder if this is actually a design flaw. Um, because uh, this thing is rated for a maximum, according to this anyway, of 120 watts, and these are 120 watt ICs, which means these things were running 
uh, pretty much damn near close to their peak rating, even if you figure it out 100 watts. And I'm kind of wondering if this was an early model that they produced and they had problems with those transistors blowing down there. And so they revised in the service manual the 200 watt part number that I ended up putting into this to solve that problem. Curious, I haven't been able to find anything to, to prove whether or not it was speaker terminals that shorted out back here that blew it out or if it went on its own. I'm kind of guessing the damage though the, the ripple of transistors that blew um, and that blew that blew these fuses as well I'm kind of thinking that it may have it may have actually been a design flaw that when you crank this thing up to a certain point and you've got the bass pumping and believe me this thing was pumping out some serious bass even when I raised it just about thir two thirds of the way there it was definitely hitting these speakers hard um, I could see it overdriving those transistors possibly or definitely shortening their life so I'm kind of guessing the, short, the transistors just shorted out because they were running at pretty much their rated maximum and and that was it that's kind of what my theory is but anyway I've got a little bit more work to do I hope I can fix this problem though I'm sure I can though it's interesting there's a lot of Toshiba ICs in this they use for controller ICs and whatnot there's another one over here in the uh, input board and there's a there are they're all Trent Toshiba's actually I can't really read this one down here but anyway I've got one problem child solved so I created the other one so I'm gonna have to fix this one now and uh, I got also finished putting the lights in this is another interesting thing about in the service manual service manual these this thing has two bulbs in it the service manual says that these bulbs are in series to one another. So voltage comes into one, goes over to the other, and it comes back out. This is not how this is actually wired. There's actually a, trans a uh, resistor right here under this uh, heat shield right here, which I find is rather interesting that they, that they put a heat shield around that. Uh, and then the other two wires are going to ground, and both lights are wired to those terminals. So they're running in parallel, not in series on this on this actual amplifier. And I don't know if that's just something they changed, um, a design that they changed for the European model or what, but uh, I found that I've got about 17 or 18 volts coming out of these leads. When I hooked up a 12 volt bulb, it didn't blow it, but I was running at about 15 volts. So I'm guessing that uh, if I put the second bulb here, these will probably be running it right up, right pretty close to 12 volts in here, I'm guessing. Because <clears throat> that uh, resistor down there is probably sized uh, to, to, to limit the amount of current based on what the milliamp rating of the bulb is. So I'm guessing that uh, you get two bulbs fed off of that um, resistor down there, it's going to uh, reduce the amount of current going to both bulbs. So hopefully it'll run at 12 volts and I'll just be able to use 12 volt bulbs in this, but uh, that'll be something I'd finish at the end. So I'm gonna get back to this and it's actually kind of nice. This thing just snaps in here. There's some little push clips in there and this whole thing comes out. At least I can get to the uh, slider controls really good so I can get some deoxid in there and uh, clean those up really good clean the uh, balance control as well so progress continues on the Fisher 871 amplifier